Good evening. Uh, I'm Tim Rogers, Village of New Paltz Mayor. I'm here tonight at Hasbrook Park. Um, two years ago, we were here on a very cold February. We were dedicating the park area to Julia Jackson, um, a former New Paltz resident. Um, we're very excited to be, to be back today to um, recognize our, our history, our, our challenge and checkered history. And we have some, some really thoughtful speakers with us tonight. Um, we have uh, town historian, Susan Stesson Cohen. We have um, a high school professor, high school teacher, Albert Cook, and uh, Jen Berry, a, a reverend uh, here in the village of New Paltz. Um, I go to lots of events here, lots of different speakers, and I'm actually very um, excited and interested to hear these thoughtful speakers tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Susan. You think that because it's already happened, the past is finished and unchangeable. Oh no, the past is cloaked in multicolored taffeta and every time we look at it, we see a different hue. Mylon Kundera. We're here tonight to honor a much beloved woman who played an important role in the life and history of 19th century New Paltz. Born sometime around 1800 in the town of Woworsing, Julia was one of possibly six enslaved individuals in the home of Benjamin Courtright, according to the census information. At that time, there were 308 enslaved people living in our town which was about 11% of the population. Derek Weinkoop, who lived at the end of Plains Road, had 16 enslaved people, the largest number of slaves in New Paltz and his residence. By the time Julia was two, she, along with her mother and sister, was sold to Thomas Merritt, who lived out on the property on Libertyville Road, which is now the site of the county fairgrounds and the county pool. In just a few years, her mother was sold off, leaving Julia motherless. When Julia was about 14, Philip Lefebvre decided to purchase Julia and give her as a wedding present to his son, Andre Lefebvre, and his future daughter-in-law, Magdalena Elting. They spoke Dutch, so Julia, similar to the experiences of Isabella Bomfrey, Sojourner Truth, had to learn another language. It is assumed that at that time, Julia met Thomas, who according to church records, married her on May 1827, just two, shy, two days shy, excuse me, just two months shy of the date when most enslaved people in the state would be freed. Initially, Julia and Thomas were both using the surname Lefevre, though by 1840, Thomas and Julia changed their last names to Jackson. According to Julia's own words, some slaves, when they were set free, would take the given names of their father and adding a termination to it, would adopt it for their own surnames. Therefore, we assume that Thomas's father's name was Jack and they added son to form Jackson. After Julia's husband died in 1889, she moved to Mulberry Street and lived there for most of her remaining years. She was known as one of the town historians often sought after for her knowledge of early 19th century New Paltz. She was a singer, a storyteller, and a spiritual leader. Julia died on Mulberry Street at the age of 98, the oldest resident of our town. There is no, there is no tombstone in New Paltz Rural Cemetery to mark her grave in a plot in the area of the cemetery that was just reserved for African Americans. So we embarked on this project to honor this wonderful, talented, and important citizen of New Paltz so that she could be properly commemorated. Thinking back to the quotation I cited at the beginning of this talk, in light of the current awakening to the ways that our country has consistently diminished and disrespected our black, brown, and native citizens, we now view the multicolored taffeta of New Paltz history with a different hue. All the newspaper articles and other records referred to Julia as Aunt Judy Jackson, and because she was so beloved, we did not see Aunt as a diminutive appellation, and our plaque was designed with that name. We now realize that language was used to diminish and, not, and, not, excuse me, and dominate 
So another plaque with Julia's real name will be placed in Hasbrook Park to honor her legacy in New Paltz. I just want to thank Dr. Stesson Cohn for her tremendous work and outstanding contributions to the memory that we are awakening to have in this instance and continue to have through all of her work here in New Paltz as our town historian. Um, I just want to speak a little bit about memorials and what they say about the people who they commemorate and about the towns and the communities that produce them. You know, memorials say that there was someone significant here. There was someone to be remembered. There was someone who significantly, significantly contributed to this community. And New Paltz, although it's a small community, has such a rich remembrance, so many names, so many stories. And I am ecstatic today to remember and even to know that someone like Julia Jackson lived here and impacted the life of many who were here. You heard Susan say that she was a spiritual leader, a storyteller, and I imagine with an appellation given to her by those who around her as aunt, that she had a charm and something compelling about her that drew the affection of those who owned her, who could sell her, who could give her as a gift. And we had a, a beautiful discussion recently about that appellation and the tension that it, it creates. You know, uh, there are times, I think, in our history where we can develop feelings for, uh, positive feelings, even affectionate ones, for people that we don't treat well. And I'm so happy today that when the plaque goes up, we'll see her name, Julia Jackson, that she chose. And we will honor her and give her the dignity that I believe she deserved. So thank you so much for joining us as we commemorate not only Juneteenth today, but the life of Julia Jackson. Good evening. Thank you, Julia. We keep our ancestors close. Juneteenth is a metaphor. Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, months after the surrender of the Confederate Army, months before those enslaved in the Union North were freed by the 13th Amendment, the roughly 250,000 black people held in bondage in Texas were informed that their enslavement was at an end. And still, it would not be until 1874 that the legal battles in Texas to re-enslave them would end. That's another nine years. To say nothing of the harm caused by the loopholes of the 13th Amendment and the violence of the premature end of Reconstruction. Juneteenth is a metaphor because we are commemorating a date when clearly we have no date to point to after which liberty and freedom for all became a reality. It is a metaphor for the ways in which what we say and what we do are so often not the same. And it's a reminder that the impact of those differences prevents our collective freedom and locks us into an enduring struggle to be reconciled to ourselves. This year, we commemorate Juneteenth with a renewed hope, with a prayer that perhaps we are nearing a date when we can say that the struggle is behind us. Hope, as any disenfranchised person can tell you, springs eternal. If we are to learn from the commemoration of Juneteenth, to take to heart that our actions should match our words, then let us begin here and now. Many of you, I know, have become aware of the Black community that tried to take root here after the end of slavery, 
clustered on Pencil Hill Road. In response to that revelation and the ensuing debates, I am happy and humbled to announce that New Paltz United Methodist Church is making space available to prominently display a historic marker honoring this community. This is a minor act of reparation as the AME Church was born out of Methodist racism. It is no accident that our church has pride of place on Main Street while the AME Church was relegated to a place near the tracks and even then deprived of the opportunity to thrive. The very least we can do is share the corner of Grove and Main in a symbolic way. I am a Christian. To be open to acts of repentance personally and as a people, that is central to my faith. We as a people have much to repent for, and I am praying every day that we might do the work of repentance. Prayers must be joined with substantive change, or they are merely noise, sound and fury signifying nothing. Forgiveness follows after and flows from repentance. We have much work to do to get anywhere near forgiveness. So, as we celebrate Juneteenth 2020, let it be the date that we here in New Paltz can point to and say that, that was the day our collective liberation began. Thank you. Thanks everyone for speaking. I think, you know, it was as as promised a, a really uh, powerful evening, and I'm really humbled and honored that that all three of you joined us this evening. And we have lots of work to do. Um, I love the reputation that New Paltz has as a, a progressive and open community, but you know, we we still have lots of work to do. And um, thanks for for uh, for being here tonight. And you know, we're gonna keep trying and we're committed to, to do better. Thanks everybody.